This is Radio Equal Shock with your host, Alex Smith. The wave of humans into cities continues around the world. But what if we can't find the fossil fuels to support those billions of people? Or we can't use them due to climate change? Can city building reverse into a pulse of humanity back to country life? Jason Bradford thinks so. Jason is a biologist, a farmer, and board president of the Post Carbon Institute. He is here to talk about his latest report, The Future is Rural, Food System Adaptations to the Great Simplification. From Corvallis, Oregon, Jason Bradford, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Hey, thanks for having me, Alex. All right. So how does a biologist become a farmer, Jason? Oh, that's, uh, that's a little bit of a long story. It wasn't really planned. Uh, life sort of happened. I guess, you know, general biology is a very good background for agriculture. It's just an applied biological science. And I was uh, really an academic researcher interested in issues related to global change and biodiversity loss. And I became kind of frustrated just uh, didn't feel like writing another paper that eight people might read was doing much. So my, my wife uh, and I moved to, uh, with our kids, moved to a small town, and she's a physician. So um, I really didn't have to worry about, you know, keeping a roof over my head and kind of, you know, re-educated myself in, in farming. And then I ended up uh, moving from the small town in Northern California up, up here to Corvallis, Oregon, and started in a, an investment company that worked on, uh, on agriculture and working on regenerative systems in farming. Right, and there's a lot of that shows up in your report, and I love some of the details that you have from actually doing it. I lived in the country. I moved to the city. Now I'm back in a rural village. I love it here. Is that a common story, and do you think it will become the common story? You know, I don't know if it's so common in the U.S. right now, but, uh, you know, you, you see this maybe happening um, or going to happen more in areas that have more recently urbanized where people have ties back to a home village or town. You know, they might migrate to the city, struggle there, uh, and then maybe have a place to go back. I think it's a little harder in places like the U.S. where we've really depopulated the rural areas and very few people are actually tied to working on the land anymore. You know, where does somebody uh, go back to? So, you know, I think you maybe are unusual in the United States, but it's probably a global pattern that, that you see once in a while uh, when, when, when economies falter, and, uh, and we'll probably start seeing that more around the world. Yes, I've met people in India, and I've talked to people uh, from China who still have very close ties to their village, and in fact, they sort of look at themselves as being an external part of the village where they can go back for family gatherings and meals and there's a lot of back and forth in other countries, I think. Yeah. What is the Great Simplification? Well, this is a term that my friend Nate Hagens uses to describe the possible trajectory of human civilization sort of this century, you know, later this century and, and following that. I believe we're likely peaking now in terms of what is called social complexity. And you could think of this as, you know, how, how diverse and long are these networks of trade that we have, um, job specialization, all of which parallels what we call globalization. And as this unwinds due to less energy of becoming available to societies, they'll sort of decomplexify, or a better said, they'll simplify. And this is likely to be messy. I'm wondering, though, is that predicted movement toward the countryside based more on the peak oil theory, which you've just expressed, or on limitations that we're going to have to place on carbon emissions because of, if we don't, we're going to hit unsurvivable climate change? That's a really good question. I mean, I don't think and haven't really seen evidence that societies are going to intentionally wean themselves off of fossil fuels as much as we make these proclamations. So, you know, ministers go to a meeting and say, yes, we will wean ourselves off fossil fuels, but then in the next meeting, they're, they're setting up policies that are going to encourage exploration and, and <laughs> of fossil fuels. So it, it doesn't look like people are we're following through on these, any of these pledges. And it doesn't look like we're wisely allocating our remaining stocks of fossil fuels to make a smooth transition. So what my thinking in writing this report is that we're, we're kind of rushing headlong towards a wall or a cliff or whatever metaphor you want to use of resource limits. And oil is one of them. It's a key one. And then we'll be left hanging. So what does someone do who understands this? And, 
you know, when writing Congress and sending checks to your local environmental groups hasn't led to any kind of change, of course. When I read between the lines of your new report, Jason, I don't see a pleasant adventure like the back to the land dream of the 1970s. This great simplification, it could be a wrenching experience, maybe driven by panic or outright hunger. What do you think? Yeah, it, it could be pretty bad, and that's why you have a lot of worry around the world right now with kids going on strikes for you know school strikes, and you know they're outright calling it the extinction rebellion. So I wrote this report because I wanted to lower the odds of the worst outcomes. You know, if we do nothing and just pretend business as usual can go on, then the worst outcome is more likely. And perhaps enough work is done now to prepare the food system, energy systems for a transformation then it can reorganize somewhat more gracefully. And this is why I frame this in terms of resilience science. It helps people, I think, see the role of the time. You can't necessarily expect the system as it is to know what to do. It's kind of locked into its current you know, way of doing things. And so there has to be some kind of stress that makes everyone sort of see, wait a second, this isn't working, and pulls, you know, lets you pull the system into new, a new state. You know, the other thing I want to emphasize is that I'm not so much saying that everyone needs to move back to countryside or that this will happen really quickly. I'm looking at kind of long-term demographic shifts as global trade networks falter and nations and regions need to become more self-reliant. And so, you know, like we were saying about rural people uh, or people that can move back to their rural village, if you're a jobless but motivated person, then a frugal life on a farm or in your village may be a way to get by and feel like you're doing something important. And a lot of people are going to be attracted to that life with with some sort of meaning and some sort of sense of control. Well, this is something that has really attracted me over the years to the Post-Carbon Institute because we have a situation where the international agencies, when they do their planning or, or the World Bank, any of those, they just sort of take the present and they double it or they expand everything to look like it is right now, but a lot more of it. And that's not going to work. We're not going to have the fossil fuels and we're not going to be able to have a climate that we can live through. So how does the Post-Carbon Institute try and seed the thoughts and, and the processes that we're going to need to make that transition? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. It's, it's a nutty situation we're in where it, it just doesn't add up, and it doesn't take a whole lot to look through this and see the problem that we're planning for a future that either can't happen because there's just not enough materials on the planet <laughs> to allow us to do this. Or if we really keep pushing it, the planetary ecosystems will break down. And those are called consequences, feedback loops. We try to point this out, you know, think in systems, build resilience, reskill yourself, and work at the community level where, you know, you can have a lot of influence actually locally and in your own community, even though it's very hard to get through at higher levels of organization and society right now. Do you think a rapid exodus of millions of people from the cities could help kill off nature? What are the risks of intensification that you write about in your new report? Oh, that's a great question because, yeah, you'll see this about future scenarios for agriculture often talk about what's called sustainable intensification. And I'm fine with the sustainable part. And, you know, my hairs raise up on the back of my neck when I see intensification because people tend not to be knowledgeable about soils and how to protect them. And typically what happens is in intensification, what you're doing is you're trying to get more and more output from the same area of land. And this usually leads to a soil decline and a downward spiral. That's the risk of intensification is if you don't do it right, it's an easier way, you know, it's a faster way to just drive your soils down. And and already our, our soils around the world are in trouble. So Right now, what most soils need is they need actually, uh, um, they need rest. They need longer rotations. They need less tillage. They need less chemicals applied. So that's actually a de-intensification is what's probably needed for our soils. But the push right now is to intensify more. And it's, it's in good intentions. It's like, well, we need to protect nature. And if we're going to grow, grow, grow. But if you realize what it's coming from is this sense that, oh, well, we're, we need, we're going to go to 10 billion people and they're all going to be eating more meat. So we need to double agricultural output, but we need to do it on a smaller area. So part of this intensification push is this also tied to this projection of vastly more material abundance in the future, which I think is completely wrong. 
Well, we've had scientists on the show who have been really concerned about soil loss, but not just the actual loss of the soil, which is pretty important, but the carbon coming out of those soils being released to the atmosphere. But we've also had a couple of small farmers on saying, with the right techniques, we can put more carbon back in, and this could help us with climate change. We can use the soil as a way of helping to avoid that fatally hotter world. Yeah. Yes, soil can provide some way of drawing down carbon. It's not a panacea. Obviously, soils have released a lot of carbon. In in agricultural systems around the world, about half of soil carbon has, has been released. So some contribution to the excess CO2 in the air is because of a loss of soil carbon. And we can put that back. That doesn't mean, though, that we can really capture not just the the carbon that has been lost from soil and bring it back, but then also compensate for all the fossil fuels that have been released. Sometimes this gets overblown, but, but yes, definitely, we need to put carbon back in the soil. It's one of the key things we need to do to make soils productive in the absence of fossil fuels and the fertilizers derived from them. So it goes hand in hand with feeding ourselves and helping uh, reduce risk of climate instability. Jason Bradford, talk to us about the key role of natural gas in modern agribusiness, and is there a way to keep up food production but use a lot less of that gas that comes from crazy sources like fracking? Yeah, sure. So the big use for natural gas in agriculture that people people think about is the Haber-Bosch process to manufacture nitrogen fertilizers. And so nitrogen gas in the atmosphere is like 78% of what we're breathing in right now is, is nitrogen gas but it's an extremely stable form, and so it's not available chemically. So what natural gas does, it provides both the energy to split the bonds and the hydrogen to reduce the nitrogen gas. So you you add add hydrogen to the nitrogen, and then you get products like ammonia, and then that's further processed so that it's it's solid and can be spread as a fertilizer. So if you do the math, you know, about about something like half the nitrogen that's in, in our bodies right now has gone through this industrial process before getting into our food. Now, you can do other things. You can, if you don't have natural gas, you can probably reduce nitrogen using hydrogen captured by electrolysis. But, uh, you know, we don't have a whole industry set up to do this right now, and it's probably hard to scale that. We might eventually say, imagine a future where we have periodic excess wind or periodic excess solar power. Maybe a good way to store that energy is by, is by making um, uh, nitrogen, uh, fixing nitrogen. But the biggest way to reduce our dependence on synthetic fertilizers is to incorporate legumes as cover crops, so legumes in pastures that rotate into other crops. Because these plants, uh, these would be like beans and peas and clovers, they naturally, with the help of a bacteria, they naturally do this process of fixing nitrogen and bringing it into the soil, enriching, enriching the soil. That's the main one. But you know, you got to think of industrial agriculture is industrial, quote unquote. So natural gas is used in all kinds of ways, right? It's, it's used in drying crops. The food processing industry uses it for heating, cooking fuel in homes, uh, key fuel in the electric grid, which keeps our food cold. So what's, once you look beyond the farm, there's actually much more energy use in the food system off the farm mostly to give us processed convenience foods, you know, to let us eat out of season and to get food from anywhere in the world. And that's, all, that's where a lot of the savings comes. And that's why I see food as being more localized and less processed. Check out the Radio EcoShock website. We're at ecoshock.org. You are tuned to Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith. Our guest is Jason Bradford, a farmer, a biologist, and a leader at the Post Carbon Institute. And your report, Jason, it contains a section on stress events to watch for. In my opinion, we've already had one key food stress event, and that was when Russia cut off wheat exports during the drought, heat, and fires there in 2010. What should we watch for in the future? Yeah, you know, I am worried about uh, bringing up natural gas again. I'm worried about natural gas prices, uh, availability going up, diesel as well. They're tied to this fracking industry that's going on. And then what this does to the cost of food. Almost any mature industry like agriculture and the food system and, say, grocery retail or restaurants, these businesses, they all start operating as they evolve into a pretty narrow profit margin. They get good at just 
knowing they can clear a little bit every year. And as energy costs go up, though, this can quickly make the food system unprofitable at about every step, from buying fertilizer to irrigating crops to renting equipment to processing food to shipping it here and there to keeping the retail stores open with all their energy and the refrigeration and lights. And and in such an environment, there would be a lot of general economic stress as well, right? So these energy costs trickle into every aspect of the economy. So this would mean that people would be less able to afford food. So, you know, this brings up the scenario, which what happens when your, you know, your cost of doing business goes up, but your customers have less money to spend. And so that often what you get is you get this inflationary pulse with commodity prices spiking, and then you get a deflationary, you know, pulse because people just can't afford the products and businesses start shutting down or laying people off. So that, that's one of the ones I worry about happening relatively soon. Well, last October, we had the first extended English language interview with the French author Jean-Marc Jancovici, and I just want to read you a quick quote. He said, I don't believe a single second that we're going to keep the standard of living that we have today on Earth with 7 billion people and just renewables. You can just forget that. It will never happen, never. We can only live with renewables with 500 million people and the standard of living two centuries ago. And we know, because we have already had this experience once, that, we know, is possible. That seems a bit harsh. What's your reading on that? Well, you know, what's interesting is this is something I don't hear very often, but I think he's, he's really right about the limits to renewables. You know, I don't want anyone to get me wrong and just hear this and say, oh, you know, he's poo-pooing the need to get off fossil fuels and and invest in renewable. No, we need to do that. We really need to do that (laughs) because a little bit of electricity can go a long way to easing life. But what what won't happen is we won't have enough solar panels or wind turbines to run our consumer economy and replace fossil fuels as they deplete. It would just take a massive manufacturing effort to make enough of this equipment. It it takes energy to do this. You know, we don't make solar panels with solar panels. We make them with fossil fuels. And the amount of energy in coal, oil, and natural gas that we use every day is so massive that, you know, we no longer have enough fossil fuel reserve to do that build out and keep everything else going. Now, regarding how many people can live on Earth as the oil age comes to an end, I don't really know. Half a billion may be right. Or, you know, part of me goes to the, the notion that, you know, we've learned a lot since the early 1800s, prior to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, we can maybe responsibly carry more people than existed in 1820. But then a lot depends on how well we manage the remaining natural resources and whether we destroy the ecosystems we will need to support us. So the other side says, well, the environment was in much better shape 200 years ago, so, and people knew how to get by without fossil fuels, and that makes me then more pessimistic. So I, it's tough to say, really. It is. It's very difficult, and I know that in my own village here, it seems only the seniors know how to really grow veggies and, and how to store food over the winter, which is pretty important in the northern climates. Are we really going to convert the iPhone generation and the Instagram folks to digging in the dirt? Oh, that's a really good question about the iPhone generation. Um, <laughs> I hope so. Um, you know, but I also want to point out that there's so much more to be done than farming itself. People are going to need to work on a total redesign and rebuild of food and energy systems to be renewable and regenerative. And so I guess if you're not attracted to digging in the dirt, so to speak, I am. I love it but not everyone is, realize it's going to take a diverse skill set to do that. And I have like a, one of my sons is not much of a, of a green thumb, but gosh, he's mechanically inclined and loves doing stuff. So he fixes tools. He helps build things. That, that's really necessary too. And I find another thing that really bothers me is that so few of us know how to collect seeds and, and we're planting hybrids that don't leave us with viable seeds I think we need to increase that knowledge and pass it on to the next generations. And maybe we need a return to the heritage varieties. Yeah, that's a really good point. I agree with you that that it's tough because these hybrids work. But, you know, the reason they work is because they've been worked on so so well. Definitely breeding programs that encourage open pollinated varieties, uh, they can produce just as well as the hybrids if you do them right. 
So we just haven't worked on it. And crop breeding that, that thinks about through these issues of not just open pollination, but thinks through issues of crops that are adapted to organic soil conditions is really important because a lot of the root systems that we have now and the crops that we have are sort of accustomed to these synthetic fertilizers. And so a big need is to make sure that we have crops that are, that are going to do the work to access organic um, nutrients and work with the soil biology. And that's, that often has genetic components that get, get lost with long-term breeding and conventional agricultural systems. And then, Jason, we have the claim that heavily urbanized humans actually save emissions per capita compared to rural people. A person, say, living in New York may not have a car. They may use more efficient mass transit, have a smaller carbon footprint than someone living in Montana or Missouri or Oregon. Do you think that's really true? You know, in some ways it is, but it's also a really, you know, oversimplified view of the situation. And this is where thinking in systems is important. So look at the history of what's happened. By depopulating the countryside in the U.S., you know, we've made life a lot more difficult for those people who remain. And I know people who farm and ranch for a living, you know, who put on 40,000 miles a year in their vehicle. And you say, my gosh, you know, how can they do that? Well, they have to. They have to because their jobs have them covering thousands of acres to manage crops and livestock. So we've made it a policy to have few and few, fewer and fewer people grow our food. And that means that those that remain are driving around like crazy. They also tend to live in or near small towns that because the population has dropped so low, have lost basic services such as grocery stores, schools, post offices, and so on. And now they've got to drive an hour to the nearest sizable city. But, you know, this is weird. The U.S. is really weird. Um, you also then have people that live, say, 20 miles outside of a city and then just have the luxury of commuting into a job. So this is sort of a rural lifestyle, not really rural workers. And so if you look around the world in general and you ask yourself, are the rural folks the ones who've joined the consumer society that, you know, are, are buying all this goods and services? No, right? You're not getting Amazon drop shipments to your village uh, in, in Ecuador, right? So what happens is, though, when migrants go to the city and they have now opportunity for you know, shopping, that's when you start to see consumption go up in general. And the U.S. Is, is just a really weird case because of our history. And how does the vision of a return to the rural relate to the World Made by Hand series, that sort of semi-fictional work by James Howard Kunstler? Mm, right. I, I think I, I read the first book. It came out quite a while ago. And if I recall correctly, it's set after a fast crash of civilization, it's not exactly clear what happened, but, you know, there's people that talk about how quickly things went, went haywire. And that, you know, maybe that's the way one, that's one way things could go. Now, my hope would be that there's a saner transition. And, and so, you know, the reason this report was, is out is, is to improve the odds of that happening versus something happening really fast. And I think the mantra of many environmentalists and energy watchers is we have to develop local resources to feed ourselves, but there is a slight risk with that, in my opinion, because we want to be flexible if extreme weather events, maybe driven by climate change, make local production impossible for a few years, say by a big drought like California had. Won't we need those large global food flows to cope with climate change? Yes, definitely. This this report, you know, really pushes localism, right? But it's not dogmatic about it for exactly what you just said. We really want to have regional connections and regional trade for maybe special, very specialty high-value items, say medicines, and also in case there's a problem, like, like you're saying, a localized famine, and you can, you can trade surplus in one area for another. So it's not about total isolationism. It's, it's about, you know, in the context of energy becoming really scarce, what do you need to do locally as much as possible? And what do you have to keep open in terms of trade for various reasons, either, like I said, specialized, high-value things you need to grow or, or manufacture, and then having greater food security still. So, yes, I think that's an important point. And I think other people, too, point to the experience of Cuba when it was suddenly cut off from sugar exports and from oil imports when the Soviet Union collapsed around 1991. There's been films made about it, a lot of talk about it. Do you think that's still 
a viable example of how we can handle this coming situation? Yes, I think it can teach us a lot. Not only did Cuba have to quickly adopt organic agriculture and start breeding oxen, but they, they set up a, a system of rationing limited food and fuel and also sharing of transportation. So if you were driving and someone wanted to ride you had, and you had space in your vehicle, you, you had to stop. <laughs> um, so imagine how nice to know if I'm hitchhiking, someone's going to stop for me. <laughs> And also urban farming became really promoted. And there was a general sense of we are in this together that kept the society from breaking down. And one of the things I like about your report is you lay out the logic of why this is bound to happen, but you don't set a date. You don't say, well, this is going to happen by 2035 for sure, because there's just, it's such a complex system. But we do know that there is an inevitable logic about fossil fuels will eventually run out and climate change really is happening. So this is going to be the eventual answer. Did I get that right? Yeah. I mean, people often um, like, wow, this is a big trend that has been going on, this urbanization. And how could you, how could you predict the opposite? Well, once you understand the energetic basis of society and what's allowed for urbanization and globalization to really go for it like it has, and you see that renewables are not going to step up and replace that, this does become kind of an obvious, logical step. And so that's why I lay it out clearly, because it is a bit like, you know, wow, no one expected this coming. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, it's, it's not hard to understand. It's just you know, saying when it happens uh, is hard. It also, it could happen in different places, you know, at different times. And I think a lot of it's going to be driven by financial situations. So I give an example of Greece uh, in the report. So a member of the EU, right? But the credit for Greece, the, the government of Greece doesn't get extended. It goes to an austerity program. People start losing jobs. And the next thing you know, people in their 20s are jobless in Athens. And so they go back to their rural homes. And that's the kind of thing you'll see it through a financial lens. But the, the financial system, the energy system are intimately tied. People don't recognize that. But as we have less and less energy, it will be, be harder and harder to make, get things to happen with money. So the new report, The Future is Rural, Food System Adaptations to the Great Simplification. Where can people get it and why should we invest the time to read it? Yeah, um, so... As you mentioned, it's from the Post Carbon Institute, so that's postcarbon.org. And uh, just look for publications on, on that website. David Hughes is going to get a new report out soon, and um, there's a podcast, actually, we've been producing uh, called Crazy Town. I don't know if you've seen that. we just got a couple episodes out now. You know, I wouldn't have written this if I didn't think it was both necessary and somewhat of a unique contribution to what's already out there. Right? There's so many books that are getting published. But really, uh, this is the only place I know where a realistic appraisal of energy futures is integrated with, with I would say, you know, given my background now, an expert view of the food system. So I have an odd and diverse background as an academic scientist. I did a lot of nonprofit activism, um, was a very small kind of farmer with hand tools, an avid backyard gardener. I end up managing a large agribusiness, you know, managing thousands of acres of crops and livestock. I work with local governments. So I'm in a position to see the world from so many perspectives and then take the time to think about how to present this challenging subject so non-experts can put this kind of information to use. You've been listening to Jason Bradford from the Post Carbon Institute, and you can find links to follow up in my show blog at Ecoshock. Dot org or go to postcarbon.org. Jason, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Hey, thanks, Alex, and, uh, and thanks for the great questions. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock. You're listening to Ecoshock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org. <laughs>